Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandalmongers podcast. And well, another bumper issue. Episode 17. Isn't that amazing? Gosh, and the subscribers are rising. Yeah, after our impassioned plea uh, in our last episode, which went out, I think, four days before this moment when we're recording. Uh, we've added about 90 subscribers, um, which is brilliant. Um, and without wanting to bore people to bits, um, I just want to remind people really that a lot of people listen to us rather than watch, um, you know, listen on Apple or Spotify. But if you want to do us a favor, hop over to YouTube, click on that subscribe button. You can always deactify the notifications so we're not badgering you with emails and that will help us um get towards our target of a thousand otherwise andrew may have to you know start selling clothes furniture things like that or we've sent up chimneys or whatever but it does take time i mean we've been talking to other successful podcasts and uh, it it can take time but you know magic number is a thousand and then then we feel we can it's worth continuing um yes yes yes. although some of us are so desperate for the affirmation and the vanity publishing thrill of what we're doing, we might drag it on anyway. But we'll have to see. <laughs> we've got well, we've got lots of great things coming up, so it'd be great to continue it. Um, it really would. It's fun. And today we look at another scandal uh, with, I uh, suppose, leading expert on the subject. Yeah, Lord Lucan. Um, amazing story. Um, complicated, dark. Um, I've been doing a little bit of research into it before we get to our interview. Um, is it something you know much about? I mean, I think you worked with this with Laura before. Didn't yes, you? I I talked to Veronica Lucan about representation, and I've followed the story for years. And I had journalists who would um, be sent off to look for Lord Lucan, have nice weeks in South African hotels, and then when the editor said come home, they'd they'd have another sighting to stay there a bit longer. Um, <laughs> people used to have their holidays on the basis of Lord Lucan. Um, uh, but it's it is a great mystery. It has everything: class, uh, an unexplained murder with lots of lots of uh, uh, unexplained bits to it, particularly forensic evidence. Uh, and uh, it's still very much within our our memory. I mean, I remember it uh, as a young sort of teenager. Uh, yeah, and I was. I discovered Agatha Christie in her final years was obsessed with the case, and it does have everything that you'd expect from a good Agatha Christie, doesn't it? You know, yep. wealthy people, slightly gone to seed, gambling, sex, exotic locations, you know, jealousy, a court case, an unsolved murder, and then a disappearance. Um, but it and, is complicated. And I just wanted to make people, because a lot of people won't know. I yep. mean, there are kind of two sides to this, aren't there? There's Veronica Lucan, who's the wife of Lord Lucan, who survived. Her story is quite simple. She's in the house. This is in the middle of a very messy divorce. Her husband's getting angrier and angrier. He's been spying on her, or he's been, um, or they've had private detectives involved. Um, they've got a new, newish nanny. Um, Veronica's in the house. She, the nanny goes downstairs to the basement kitchen, doesn't come back. She goes down, finds the nanny dead, is then attacked by a shadowy figure um, who she recognizes as her husband, Lord Lucan. And then kind of slightly bizarrely, he stops attacking her and offers to kind of help sort of bandage her up. And they go upstairs. Exactly. They talk talk for a bit. I mean, you know, it's all a bit unusual. Everything about the case is. And then she. And and the children are there as well. I mean, the the children see the father. Yeah, the children see him. They have a bit of a chat, even though there's a dead body in the basement. She then takes the opportunity to run out and, and raise the alarm and says, my husband's just killed somebody and nearly killed me. Um, then he's gone. They, they, by the time she gets back and the police arrive, he's gone, never to be seen again. So that's her version. His version, which he writes, he writes several letters to his mates before he disappears, is that he's walking past the house because he lives nearby. I think he was a bit of a stalker of her, actually, from the sound of it. And he hears a commotion, goes in, finds the body, sees his wife being attacked, scares the bloke off, runs away, stays for the talk. How does that explain her injuries? I mean, that she's also been attacked by the other intruder. I don't know. A lot of it's very complicated. And then really, the thing that's quite damning for Luke, Luke and though, 
As he disappears, his car is found, New Haven, which is a port people use for going to France. His car is found with a bit of lead pipe with blood on it. And as we'll probably explain, the forensics are all a bit of a mess. But I guess his case would be he took that lead pipe to help cover up whatever had happened. Perhaps he'd hired this bloke, and that's one of the theories. Anyway, he disappears. Uh, and for years, it was assumed he was the murderer. And, and there are lots of things to point at him being a murderer. He makes a great villain. Um, but then Laura came along with a very different take. Yes, and a much more sympathetic take to Lucan. And uh, I find her take pretty persuasive, actually. I mean, here we have this, it was he, he sort of becomes a caricature of a sort of immoral aristocrat um, gambling. And, uh, and he turns out to be actually quite an intelligent, sensitive man, plays the piano, devoted to his children. Uh, and it's very hard to reconcile uh, this picture with, with this, this frenzied attack. Uh, but I think he felt that he'd been... He wasn't going to get a fair, fair case, uh, and he panicked. Um, yeah, in his letters, he says, because he lost, he lost the custody battle, and he felt that the judge would never, a judge would never believe him. His story seems so incredible, but he happened to come across this murder in progress, so he thought they would never believe me, and either dis either killed himself or disappeared and lived somehow for many and years. And maybe, maybe listening and watching to this podcast, who knows? Well, if, if so, um, please subscribe. <laughs> we don't care about your murder or not. We want your no. subscription. No, I'm sorry. You reveal his identity. That is so no. <laughs> sorry. But it's, it. um, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's a continuing mystery. And I think Laura has a theory which she's going to, to raise in, uh, in the discussion. It's quite um, brave of her, though, isn't it? Because we, we get attached to our stereotypes. And he, he does make a great villain. And to actually challenge the word of a victim, um, a female victim of male violence, yeah. and let's face it, there's an awful lot of that happens in our world. Is quite, but I looked. Veronica was a very unusual person. She had this weird website for years when websites were first a thing, in which she 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 kind of attacks her own children and writes very strange stuff about the hats she used to wear, and why going to the inquest of the nanny was all so important that she wore the right hat. I mean, and, and she does give contradictory statements uh, throughout her life, different accounts to the newspapers. She wrote books. Um, and indeed, I think it's quite revealing that she did fall out with children who I think made a big effort to to sort of try and include her in their lives, invited them to their weddings, which she didn't attend. But also that that even members of her own family sort of were not convinced that Veronica was was as innocent as she she proclaimed. I mean, I think the other person we have to remember is, of course, Sandra Rivers, the the, the 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 nanny who was murdered. She'd only been there, I think, ten weeks. She was very popular. Um, uh, I think Veronica was quite jealous of her. Uh, and, you know, I, I think in sometimes these stories, we forget about the victim. We're so worried, so interested to find out who, who did it. Um, but she just seemed to be a poor woman in the wrong place. And she herself had children the same age as the Lucan children. Mm. And it's rather poignant. I think one of them only discovered um, much later in life, actually, after he was adopted, who his real mother was. I mean, you got this book published, didn't you? You represented Laura. No, I don't represent Laura. No, I am great. No, no, I'm a great admirer of Laura's books. She did, in fact, book on Agatha Christie. Uh, I think she's a very good researcher and writer, and um, uh, she just seemed to be the obvious person. If we're going to look at some scandals, this is a, a, a pretty juicy one. Certainly is. All right. Well, I think we've probably set the scene. What do you say? Yeah, I hope people have got the sense of 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 what happened at, on that night in 1974, uh, and then. I think she can begin to explain a little bit more. All right, let's go to the interview. Well, we're delighted, Laura, that you can join us because, I mean, your book really sheds enormous new light on the Lucan uh, story. In fact, you revised it, I think, after Veronica Lucan died. Mm. And can you just explain to people what, in the sense, the Lucan story is about? Well, it's one of the greatest stories of the modern era, I would say. It's... um. It all happened, uh, well, it, it's coming up to 50 years ago. Um, 1974, the famous night of the 7th of November, and a murder took place in one of those tall, stately white stucco houses um, in Belgravia, 46 Lower Belgrave Street, and the body of a young woman, um, a nanny, 
Sandra Rivet, 29 years old, was found in the basement of this uh, beautiful house. So, and the, 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 the police theory, which is now sort of accepted as the official theory, is that Sandra Rivet was killed in error, um, in a case of mistaken identity, that Lucan's real target was his wife, Veronica, from whom he'd been estranged for coming up to two years. And there'd been an incredibly, what was at the heart of it all, was an, a, a, a vicious custody battle over the, the couple's three children, which Lucan thought he would win and Veronica won. And what I was told was it, 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 he never really got over that. Uh, he believed he would be the fit parent um, there were people who agreed with him about that, and he he lost so much money on the case. And then, as a professional gambler, um, of which he was quite successful, he then became chasing money. Which, as we know, as a gambler, you can't do that. He was trying to get enough money to contest the custody decision. Um, and meanwhile, Veronica was living at Lobo Grave Street. That was eating money. He had a home around the corner that was eating money. Everything was eating money. He was declared a bankrupt um, after his famous disappearance on at some point on the night of the early hours of the 8th of November. And he was then declared guilty of murder in his absence at an inquest, which you now can't do. You can't name a person in an inquest like that. Um, so you have two mysteries, really. What really happened on the night of the 7th of November, 1974, because nobody really knows. We know what Veronica Lucan told us, which is probably true, but we don't know. And she, we she, know- She was injured too, wasn't she, that night? She was yes, that's true. She had head injuries. Um, there was a question put at the inquest, could these have been self-inflicted? But I know that's unlikely. Um, so you have that, and then you have, his disappearance, what happened to him thereafter, at which there have been so many theories. And I mean, do you, I mean, there have been lots of books on the Lucan case. So why did you do your book? Did you feel you had something new to say? Did you feel that perhaps um, people had been too, because your book is very sympathetic to Lucan and his circle, and I think was the first book that really sort of challenged the official police version? Really, was it? Um, I mean, I've certainly read a couple of uh, if you read the press and the 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 coverage at the time, yes, it's you you get what I call in the book the Lucan myth, um, and and I say in the book you can't challenge a myth, you can't really challenge a myth. It will always pop back up again because it's so satisfying. The the and the myth here is um, of an evil, powerful man with a kind of mentality of droit de seigneur who believed he had the right to his children, the right to kill in order to um, regain the status quo to which he thought he was entitled, and these poor, pitiful female victims. And that is a very, it's a narrative in which we believe very easily, and it's credible. And I don't say in the book that it's not true. It may well be true. But it is a. it is coming from, a, a, a slightly different generation. I sort of grew up knowing about Lucan, but not with that that intensity, that almost visceral loathing that he seemed to generate in, you know, very um, distinguished writers and journalists at the time, people like Richard Ingram, people like that. They they didn't just, they, they really hated him, it seemed to me. And they well, also... Him. His circle was seen as rather well, dissolute, the Claremont Club and all that. Yes. And you, what you do is, in some ways, you use the murder as, as a way of talking about class at the time and changing social conditions. Uh, so it's not just a murder investigation. It's, it's a sort of piece of social history, really, isn't it? Well, that's very generous, Andrew. Thank you. Um, well, it seemed to me so interesting to be an Earl in 1974 who didn't have a lot of money. You know, it's all very well being an aristocrat who's like the Duke of Devonshire or something like that, and they're 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 rich, so they can function in the modern world. But what the sort of metaphor that stuck in my mind when I um, was the Clamour Club that you um, mentioned 
which was where Lucan spent a, a, a huge amount of his life, which was on Barclay Square. And it was like a home from home. It's exceptionally beautiful, tricked out, almost like an eight. So you could fulfill the fantasy of being one of those 18th century earls, you know, who spent his life at Brooks's or something and would gamble on, you know, whether, whatever, whether Miss whatever would kick her legs at Drury Lane that night or something like that and gamble away fortunes and think it was a wonderful thing. And the Claremont sort of recreated that atmosphere so Lucan could feel, I, I suspect, at home and very Earl-like. And he looked very Earl-like. But what happened when John Aspinall, who ran the club, sold it, um, and it was bought by Playboy. And I went to meet Victor Lowndes, who ran Playboy in London at that time, you know, bunny girls and all that. And he said to me, oh, yeah, I brought in all those guys. You know, they sat there. They gave tone to the place. None of them had any money. Luke and none of his friends. They were all completely, they were all tapped out by Aspinall. They would sit there like waxworks while all the rich Arabs, the men who really had the power and the money, would come in and gamble and make the place um, lucrative. But the other guys sat there like now, I've, I've, nothing to me was a, a, a finer visual metaphor of London in the early 1970s when most people yeah. lost all their money. But you also make a much more sympathetic, Lucan. I mean, you're a biographer, and in some ways, you know, you show that Veronica was not the easiest wife. And I mean, uh, and you you paint a picture of all these people, actually, who are um, uh, paint a very different picture of Lucan than, than the myth that's been projected, really. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you, um, because you, you're absolutely right, you, you, you paint an amazing picture of London at a time of change and understanding Luke and Moore and his world. But I, I was thinking to myself, if you were a male writer, mm. it would have been a lot harder, I think, because, you know, the heart of this is a dead, a dead woman and an injured woman. Mm. And, you know, it must be very difficult to say, well, look, let's just look at the bigger picture and try and have some sympathy for Luke. And, and I think maybe a man would have had a... Well, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. What do you think? No, I think that's a really good point, Phil. I mean, and I have to say... I don't actually think uh, I convinced that many people, if I'm honest. Um, people were nice about the book, um, but I can remember doing an event. I stopped doing them, actually. I did an event about it. And a woman um, sort of yelled at me, you don't know what it was like being a wife in the 70s or something. Well, I do, because my mother was one. And she wasn't an oppressed, victimised woman like they would. I mean, it... But it did. You, I think that's what I mean by you can't challenge a myth. Whatever I say about Lucan and that every single person I spoke to liked him a hell of a lot more than they liked Veronica, people would simply say, but they're posh. They're, they're privileged people. They're, um, he was one of them. Um, something like that. It doesn't matter that Veronica herself was a countess and that her own sister, Christina, who sort of started the ball rolling by talking to me in the first place, which I never dreamt anybody would do. Um, and her brother, uh, her husband, Bill Shankid, and they took in the, the Luke and children, they got custody of them, in fact, in, I think it was 1982, um, and brought them up and really ran the show. And they, Bill was quite bitter about it. I, I got the impression. Um, but, you know, her own. So, to, to sort of this sort of myth that Veronica was like this um, middle class feminist heroine taking on these frightful quasi Bullingdonites, um, it's, it's just not true. Well, also the children fell out with her, didn't they? I mean, you know, she she claimed that they didn't want anything to do with her, but actually there's a lot of evidence that they tried to keep in touch and they were always, even the Shan kids and others, were always very good about not, uh, in a sense, uh, denigrating Veronica uh, for the sake of the children. Absolutely. But of course, the, what it all boils down to really, in my, in my view, I mean, you know, I'm fascinated to hear what you think, but it's that... The police had this theory, and I met one of the police. Um, he was he he was. I met him down in Chichester, and he was he was kind of really nice, really, but 
life on Mars, you know, but um well no no dear I mean we we knew who'd done it you know blah 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 and of course the forensics were I mean almost laughable they every you know they, they had to eliminate about 50 sets of fingerprints from that house from just roaming policemen who felt like having a look at this um in Congress murder. murder scene, yes, go on, sorry. It's a very amateur investigation. And then they were going to his flat and having parties at his flat, weren't they? Yes, using the his police. exercise. I mean, body. very unprofessional. Unbelievable. Um, and Unbelievable. the forensics, the blood, the blood, there were different blood groups spread all over the place that no one could quite account for. No, I mean, there, I mean, there are difficulties which, for example, all we knew was that Sandra Rivet was blood group B, Veronica Lucan was blood group A. A and B were found on the, the sack into which this poor woman's body had been stuffed. Um, you know, really horrendous. Um, nobody knew what blood group Lucan was. Nobody knew what his fingerprints were. I mean, it's sort of beyond belief. Um, but when it was brought up at the inquest, why is blood group A on this mailbag in, in which this woman's body has been stuffed. And they said, Veronica Lucan did not go in the basement and anyone who says she did is, you know, a liar. Well, it doesn't mean she did go in the basement, but it was an avenue of inquiry which was instantly shut down because the police had decided that night uh, what had happened. And I don't say it isn't what happened. It may well be what happened. Because you I look don't, at other theories. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, other theories like like the, the fact that Lucan paid someone perhaps to commit a burglary, uh, which went wrong, which seems yes. slightly unlikely. Yes, um, I agree. But I mean, there are lots of different theories to try and account for it. And again, Veronica's account of the time scale doesn't always fit in with with the facts. So yeah. she may have misremembered. But presumably, you were able to put things after her death that you couldn't put in the first edition. Yes, quite a lot. Yes. Um, because what it all bo boiled down to, which was where I, I, I get sidetracked, that was where, where I was, um, is that the police had a, a had a, a, a version of the, the marriage, which is the key to the whole thing and the most interesting thing about the whole thing, really. It struck me as one of those marriages where both brought out the absolute worst in the other and both sort of wanted to destroy the other. And really, in the end, she destroyed him. Uh, but it didn't make her very happy. Um, because several people said, oh, no, she was always madly in love with him, you know. And it, it it boiled down to whether you believe the police notion that Lucan, instead of just divorcing her when they weren't getting on, decided to sort of gaslight her and make out that she was going insane, taking her off to psychiatrists that she didn't really need to go and see, and thereby getting her hooked on drugs that she didn't need to be on from where from whence paranoia sort of spiraled um instead of what i was told by the shang kids which was that she always was a bit unstable a little bit you know nothing wrong before with that married. say that again andrew sorry, sorry sorry before they married yes from a child um but that well that's not a crime. You 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 need uh, um, looking after or correct help, which I don't believe she got. And I can I can sort of imagine a setup whereby an unimaginative bloke like Lucan, who I don't even know why he married her in the first place. There were rumours he was gay, in fact, but he would have wanted an heir, of course. Um, he married her. She was Bill's sister-in-law. He thought a lot of Bill, I think, and it all just sort of fitted. Um, and, and her sort of getting postnatal depression and so on, I can completely understand him saying, oh, God, bloody hell, what am I going to do, you know, and doing not the right things, but not out of evil motivation, out of sort of unimaginative incompetence. Um, but it was a question of whether you believe the police version of events that he deliberately, he deliberately planted stories about her. He deliberately told all his friends that she was mad and evil. Um, I, I do find that quite difficult to believe, if I'm honest. 
But his story, yeah. but, sorry, Tim, his, his story was that he um, uh, sort of just happened to be passing the door and saw someone right. in there and popped in, which is, seems a slightly unusual explanation. Well, I was going to ask that. How do we know? Did Luke and ever give his own account of that night before he disappeared? Well, the, the, what Andrew's alluding to, um, he wrote that it's unbelievable how little we know. I mean, it's terribly frustrating. When I wrote the book, I thought, oh, God, I'd give anything, sort of almost anything to know what really happened here. Um, because there's no theory, to my mind, that, that totally fits the facts. Well, I do have one, um, but it's a bit off the we'll, wall. We'll get to that later. <laughs> yeah, you probably can imagine what I'm going to say. Um, it was but, Veronica. Well, yes. That... That's what two people said to me, two people who knew her very well. But she was very small compared to him. Well, it's not a very nice thing to talk about, but I could never understand why Sandra was very small, why it was such a vicious, prolonged attack. I would have thought a big man could have done it more efficiently, maybe. It was a prolonged. What, what, what was the motive for Veronica? Because I mean, Sandra was was they just been watching TV in bed together, um, not in, uh, in bed together, but on the bed. Well, so she says. Um, I don't think that's. Yeah. Um, well, they were. Sandra was only there for about. I think it was ten weeks. She hadn't even unpacked all her things, and. Well, there are two schools of thought about why Veronica might have done it. One, she was paranoid about some of the nannies. Uh, I met one of the nannies. I met the nanny who was there before Sandra, in fact. She was very pro-Lucan. Um, she thought Veronica was a total nightmare. But again, you come back, did Lucan make her a nightmare? That's the thing. Um, but it, 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 it's, it was... She had, and like somebody said that she had the idea that Sandra was in league with Lucan, reporting back to Lucan uh, that she was an unfit mother, so he could get the children in the, the the upcoming custody battle that he really was seriously planning to revisit that judgment. Um, so she thought she might have thought Sandra was a spy on his behalf because that was something she sometimes said, or to frame him, to frame him. She was very angry he'd left her. I mean, and that's presumably why he disappeared, because he felt he wasn't going to get a fair trial. Because I think the two other big questions is, why did he disappear? And did he disappear? Or is he still living in South Africa um, or wherever? Uh, and how and did the, the, the Clement Club and people in some ways uh, support his, his disappearance? Because there were several people like Susan Maxwell Scott, the woman that he went to see in Uckfield that night, who didn't actually come forward to the police. Uh, it was only the revelation of a letter with a postmark from Uckfield that for, that actually allowed the police to realise that, that he had been around that night. Absolutely. And there are lots of stories about decoy cars going to New Haven. And anyway, I'll leave it with you. I've done that. Um, he was something else. He really was uh, very entertaining, but goodness me. Um, and that relates what Andrew's just said there relates back to what you the question you asked, Phil, which was he wrote a letter to Bill Shankid. He wrote two letters, in fact. But in one, he said, I was walking past the house. And um, yeah, and that was also the story that he told Susan Maxwell Scott. She said, I'm sure he didn't, that um, he was walking past the house, looked in the basement, saw an attack going on and rushed in. Of course, that's rubbish. Um, but that was his, you know, what he came up with. But um, my problem with did he disappear is I don't know what the hell he's been living on for 50 years because he had no money. He was bankrupt. Most of his friends had no money. The only ones who had any money were James Goldsmith, um, who might seriously doubt would have spent money on supporting Lucan in Botswana or whatever, and John Aspinall, whom, uh, who, the, the, the Claremont, the creator of the Claremont, really, whom I sort of blame for a lot of this, really, because he was, um, you know, this kind of ringmaster aspect that he had 
talking to the police, talking to the press, you know, um, giving the whole set an extremely bad name. And rightly so, because when you read some of the things he said, they come across appallingly, just appalling. This terrible arrogance and all this rubbish about, oh, John Lucan was a, a, a superior being and all this drivel. Um, but the others whom I met before they died were not like that at all. And I mean, Charles Benson, whom I used to see as a child at White City Dog Track when I used to go there with my father, I mean, he was just a sort of, he was a bloody racing tipster in the newspapers. The idea that these people were rich and powerful masters of the universe, it's, it's terrible. You know, it's so silly, I think. But I think he died that night, Lucan. I do. Um, and how did he die? Well, well, I would imagine the, the, the old-fashioned theory that he jumped off a, um, jumped off a ferry. Um, I mean, Veronica always said into the propellers of the, of the boat so yes. that his body couldn't be found. That he did that deliberately out of yeah. a noble... Which is a very sort of horrible way to die. Yeah. Um, somebody else said that. Stuart Wheeler, do you remember him? UKIP man. Uh, he was, I mean, he was very interesting about it. And he said, Michael Stoop, whose car Lucan had borrowed and was going about in a tatty old car, so he could sort of see what was going on um, at Low Belgrave Street with the children. He, Michael Stoop said that. Um, not even deliberately, he just jumped and he did get caught in the propellers. But, I mean, people do disappear, don't they? Because the fact that there were so many sightings, there's stories of children being given passports to go to Botswana. I mean, there are numerous documentaries. I mean, you know, with enough evidence to, to perhaps raise questions that he, he may have survived. Um, Sounds like you think he may have done. I don't know. I have an open mind on it, yeah. uh, but it's clearly the myths continue. And I think, I mean, are, are there some people still alive from that circle now, or are they all dead? I mean, you have this great contact who was an old Etonian school friend, for example, yes. that you don't he, name then, and I don't know if you can name now. Well, he uh, he is dead, um, but I sort of made a very firm promise. But he was a very upright, what. Well, you know, individual. He was a very impressive, you know, great and good and all that. They were not, I think, I'll tell you the one who convinced me the most was Lucan's sister. I don't know if she's still alive. I sort of flew to New York for a day to, to talk to her. And she was, because as of course you know, both his parents were very left-wing. His father took the Labour, I mean, he was the Labour whip in the House of Lords, wasn't he, or something. Um, and his mother was a vehement campaigner for the Labour Party. And Lucan sort of took, he was he rebelled against that by, you know, joining Brooks's or whatever. And um, the sister, Jane, the older sister, was very much of her parents' persuasion, um, a real sort of New York Democrat. Um, she said the Claremont was extremely distasteful to her. Very, very nice woman. And she sort of convinced me that he was not evil. He may have gone off his head with frustration and anxiety about the children, whom I don't think were being looked after. I mean, Christina Shankid said that to me they were. Now, that may not have been Veronica's fault. She said all the nannies left because my husband wouldn't pay them. I was also told the nannies walked out because they couldn't stand it there. Um, I, I had dealings with Veronica. I was going to do Veronica's memoir, and I mean, she was as bad as a fruitcake. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I imagine the second is more likely than the first. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it seems um, to me, Laurie, what you've tried to do is very, very hard. You've tried to contextualise somebody who is seen, as you say, the myth, the easy myth, the evil killer, the powerless yeah. female victims, 
Women, the women, women have no agency, and you've given them agency. But uh, you must, and I'm sure you are. You must have been always concerned, though, not to, not to kind of give a pass to a man who might well have killed her. We, and, no, and I, I think, should, yeah. And if you had to put your hand up now and say he did or he didn't, I mean, I'm not clear from the book whether which way you jump actually. But no. that's why it's such a good book. Well, that's well. Thank you. That's terrible. I was very convinced by people saying to me he was squeamish. I know that sounds ridiculous um, because the sister, the the lady in New York, she was a doctor, and she said, you know, John could never bear blood. He just couldn't look at it, and that sort of stuck with me somehow. And the the best friend said that as well. The one I don't know. Um, what also struck me was how grief stricken they were about it all. They were very conscientious about Sandra. And because I know she's been the forgotten person in all this. But you, um, do, you, know, you do talk about her life. Uh, oh, well, actually. I hope. Yeah, I hope that's so. Because um, she had had a very tough life. I mean, she had she a did. young child the same age as one of the Lucan children uh, who's been brought up by her parents and indeed yeah. another child that had been adopted. Who uh, thinks he's found Lord Lucan? Really, because also he only discovered who his mother was when he was given an envelope, I think, when his mother died, his yeah. adopted mother. Yeah, yeah. D -d -d Appalling. Appalling. What a mess. What a mess. Yeah, exactly so. That was what struck me with with particularly the, the sister. I mean, she was palpably upset. Um, guilt, almost, that because she was not... She was an aristocrat, but not of that mindset. And I think it, it did seem like this terrible thing of this young woman coming into a this house in Belgravia and being the collateral damage in this Strindbergian marriage. Um, it is, it's atrocious, just atrocious. But they, I mean, at the, at the time I, 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 I favored, if anything, the hitman theory. Um, because simply because a, a man of Lucan's type, I, I think, would employ someone, and certainly someone like John Aspinall would have known someone. Just because you have to know villains if you run a um, a gambling uh, so place. The, the hitman <laughs> to kill his wife, but unfortunately kills Sandra by mistake. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and um, would that explain the blood, um, uh, the, the the problems of the blood? Because there were even blood in the garden, for example, which yeah. Although that could have been those plods tramping also, about. Right. And how the person got into the house, let in by Lucan or given a key? I suppose so. I do go into all this in, in great detail, which nearly sent me off my head. Because, because you can't make it fit. You can't. And also, as we've said, there's so much you don't know, which is really frustrating. So much you don't know. Um, but when I rewrote it for the, the 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 revised edition, I did come down on on uh, it being Veronica. I did, I did, and I now think sometimes, oh, don't be so ridiculous. And then sometimes I think she was very clever. She was much cleverer than he was, and um, and she was I very good. <laughs> she was, she was. You know, she I played the little girl lost, didn't she? Which is, if, why, if, that, if that was the case, Laura, what, why would Lucan disappear? Just because yeah, he it, knew he would be blamed or kill himself. That, exactly so. Um, well, that was what Christina, who was very, she was very conflicted, Christina Shankid. She had sympathy with her sister, Veronica, of course. And um, Bill, Bill, Bill was less conflicted. Um, but she also very much liked Lucan and couldn't, she sort of said, you know, you just couldn't explain to people that he really wasn't like he's being portrayed. And I still feel I can't. I can imagine people listening to this and thinking, oh, don't be ridiculous. You know, I really can imagine that because you're trying to see a, a kind of mythic figure, a kind of hate figure who's everything we are allowed to hate today. You know, the upper classes, the, the white male upper class, you know, he's he's. He's the one type of person you're allowed to attack today, really. And he is it par excellence, and he looks the part par excellence. But Christina just didn't see him that way, and a lot of people didn't see him that way. 
And it, 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 according to her, he, he'd, he'd, he'd failed to convince a judge in a custody case, and that really destroyed him, just destroyed him, losing the kids. And she, he felt he would never convince a judge in another scenario, i.e., I didn't kill Sandra Rivett. I didn't. It wasn't me because he knew that Veronica would absolutely convince everybody that he did, which she has. She has done that. And <clears throat> as I say, perhaps rightly. Is this a scenario where we may get new information? We may get a solution to this story because it's it, is it an active case, for example, with the Metropolitan Police? Uh, I, be I believe it is because um, Neil Berryman, who is. Sandra's son, who was the one who was away at birth, but he has taken it upon himself, which I completely understand, to um, be his mother's advocate, if you like. Um, he says he has found Lord Lucan in Australia. Um, I beg leave not to believe him, but I also believe he is sincere. And he, I think... I could be wrong, but I think he said the case was still active. But I, what do you think? I find it very hard to believe that anything is going to be. Everybody's dead. Mm. We we have we got time for one more. We've got time for one more question because we're running okay. out of time. And, and what's the sort of legacy been to the family? Because I mean, yeah. we you know Lord Lucan is, is his son has now taken his his title. Mm. They're now grandchildren. The story's moved on from these very yeah. traumatic events. Uh, Sandra Rivet is 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 now remembered as this tragic victim. Uh, I mean, what what is is now the significance of this? In a sense, could have been just a domestic murder. Yeah, it just it, it's such a now that time has moved on and people who were actually there are, are um you know there aren't very many of them with us anymore. Um, Almost everybody's dead. So now it's 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 history, and it's um it's a peerless piece of social history. I think it's a microcosm of social history. Like I said earlier, that shift from ar aristocratic London to money London, um, the whole the class structure, which is kind of like the, the emblem of it in that house um, that down in the basement is where the you know I mean the, the these dark terrible deeds took place and the the it's a, a perfect emblem of what fascinates us. Maybe it shouldn't, but it does, about murder, you know, the, the perfection of the facade and what goes on behind. Um, and it's a story about marriage, as I say. And it's a, I don't think I put this, I think I put this in my Agatha Christie book, but that quote from John Fowles, nothing lasts like the unsolved. And I, I, just, I just think it's one of those. Mm. Um, and as I say, now it's it's now there's a whole load of people who haven't even heard of it. And um, I'd just love to know what they they all are going to make of it, really, whether they're going to see it differently or whether the myth will subsist. I don't I don't. You well, know. Thank, thank you for this conversation and for bringing such a very different perspective to a story that most people think they know and really, they really don't. Well, thank you. A total pleasure. Thank you so right. much. Well, thanks we'll very see much. You soon and thanks again. Bye. Bye. Bye now. Well, I mean, that's pretty extraordinary stuff. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, was it an intruder or did he d panic, perhaps panic and, and, and suddenly have second thoughts? Why were so many of his friends so reluctant to talk to, to the police? Uh, and was Veronica actually the, the, the murderer? Um, you know, was she inflicted the wounds on herself, perhaps? Um, and he, and then he, he never, to frame him. but in his own letters, he accepts he was in the house after the attack. And he, yeah. I think he claimed that he saw an attacker flee. So it's, I mean, what I love about her book and, and, and just talking to her, you can see that she's such an intelligent person is that she doesn't actually say she solved it, but she just takes you into this incredibly rich and complicated world where, you know, you do challenge all your preconceptions, don't you? Yes, and I think she's very careful to lay out, you know, the forensics don't add up. I mean, there were blood, blood in various places that perhaps was carried um, by 
on foot. I mean, the police investigation clearly was very flawed. They thought they had their man and basically didn't look at anything else. But I think also the timings, the, the accounts that Veronica gives are not always, uh, don't, don't always tie in with other people's memories of, of what happened. And that could be just a mistake. But uh, I, I think she certainly has raised some very interesting questions. And you know, why did he, they go upstairs and spend 35 minutes dealing with her wounds rather than with a dead body downstairs? It's extraordinary. Um, you know, there, there is something rather callous about the, the whole episode, whoever, whoever, um, and what happened after Sandra was killed. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as you said uh, at the beginning of the, of the show, um, you know, Sandra, the victim, it's, it just seems so very unlikely that you could murder somebody who doesn't look like the person you're supposed to be murdering at all. Um, and and, and the, the police would assume that that was a mistaken identity. Uh, yes, and it was quite light down there. Though I think one of the rather sort of, I think, sad things was the fact that the light bulbs were, were, weren't working. To save money, they'd taken some of the light bulbs out. Uh, and this again brings us to this idea of of, of this very rich, well, still quite rich, aristocratic family, actually a little bit on their uppers, mm. and um, you know, living slightly hand to mouth. He was trying to pawn silver and things. It's you know, it's 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 all behind this veneer and the smart part of London. Terrible things were were going on. Dark deeds done in the dead of night, behind the facade of normality. It yeah, is, but it know, doesn't. The, Real Please life, of course, are touched by it, but we we can't help it. Maybe it's just morbid curiosity. Um, yeah, to find this stuff fascinating. You know, I mean, I think we do look look what's on every Netflix documentary. Um, I mean, whether we'll ever know the truth, whether there will be some confession found, someone come forward who has some new light to shed, maybe even Lucan himself. I mean, I suspect Veronica has taken many secrets to the grave. I think she probably has. Well, I think that's probably concluded our episode. It was certainly, a, a, I found it fascinating. I hope the listeners and the viewers do as well. Well, we try and bring something different every week. We do indeed. All right. Cheers, Andrew. Thanks so much. Matt. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandal Mongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandal Mongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 